the city is moving in the right direction. We're seeing tremendous job growth, uh, more than at any time in my life. Um, it's a very exciting time. Optimism is spreading, uh, not just in the urban core, but in neighborhoods like Walnut Hills and Price Hill, and North Side, and uh, elsewhere. Forbes magazine, two years in a row, said we're the number one city in America for somebody with a college degree. Number one, not Charlotte, not Austin, not New York, not Chicago, but us, which is very exciting. And we have seen over the last couple of months and years some of the largest announcements of new jobs in the history of the city. Four years ago, GE on the river didn't exist. The entire building, the Riverfront Park wasn't completed. Four years ago, we didn't have the fourth largest employer in Ohio, uh, Mercy Health, headquartered in Bond Hill. Uh, we hadn't had the announcement of Kroger building the first grocery store in downtown in 40 years and a $90 million building on top of it. And then there were some things that we did regionally, like track southwest to the airport. Amazon.com and DHL adding thousands of jobs in Louisville, Kentucky, which we helped with. We took, we've taken a regional approach to trying to attract jobs and businesses uh, to the city. And a couple weeks ago, the largest single investment in the history of the city, a children's hospital agreed to expand by a half a billion dollars, 550 million, to expand its critical services in Avondale, which as we all know is one of the highest crime and highest poverty neighborhoods uh, in our city, which is very exciting uh, in light of the fact that we lost Jewish and Bethesda over the last 25, 30 years to see children's expanding in the city and adding jobs in the city. I also think it's important to point out that four years ago, uh, people did not necessarily believe, in fact, they didn't believe that we were heading in the right direction. At that time, we had what are called brownouts, where Entire fire stations are shut down uh, because there aren't enough firefighters. And that means if you have a medical emergency like a heart attack, they can't get to you in the appropriate amount of time uh, required by professional standards. What we didn't know at the time was that we were about to hit this heroin crisis where our firefighters are now spending most of their days reviving people with Narcan uh, from overdoses. We had seen a reduction in the police force by 150 cops. Uh, we had seen a demoralized uh, police department. And there was an $800 million unfunded pension liability that the had been kicked down the road for a long time. The budget had been balanced in seven years. And S&P and Moody's, a month or two before I was elected, for the first time in my lifetime, downgraded the city's credit. So over the last four years, we had to rebuild the foundation that I believe has allowed for the amazing job growth that we've seen and the fact that people believe in the future again in the city. So we balanced the budget. In the first year, I had to do something very tough. I had to go to the unions and retirees and ask them to give up benefits from their pension in order to save the city from bankruptcy. It's not a fun thing to do, but it had to be done. And that's what leadership is about. And so we balanced the budget, solved the pension crisis, and last year we earned an upgrade from S&P and Moody's. We have a net increase of 60 firefighters that have ended the brownout, so we now can respond both to you in a medical emergency and to the overdoses that unfortunately are only growing. We put 100 more cops on the street, and we're seeing a re-encouraged uh, uh, effort of community-oriented policing not the least of which was the, is the current upgrade that we have that I called for of the collaborative agreement. So those foundational pieces are the bedrock of what we've been able to do to attract business and jobs to the city. But what I'm most excited about is that our progress has been and is going to continue to be progressive. And so at the same time that we built new buildings like GE, We've, been in, we've invested a historic increase in human service efforts through our Hand Up initiative, which is partnering with best-in-class, evidence-based job training programs like Cincinnati Works and Cincinnati Cooks, 
and the Urban League and Easter Seals and Community Action Agency and Mercy Neighborhood and, uh, Health Services to help people, predominantly single mothers, get the job skills to get back into the workforce with a living wage. And we've seen the poverty reduction rate uh, been reduced over the last five years. Even larger than that is the Child Poverty Collaborative, which is kicking off. We had a big press conference this week where dozens, in fact, 28 separate human service organizations agreed to put competition aside and work together, share information, collaborate to work on helping 5,000 families transition out of poverty over the next five years. We've had for too long the designation of being one of the leaders in the country in child poverty. One piece of bad news and an otherwise good news story of our city's comeback that I find morally reprehensible and why I put more time into working on anti-poverty issues than any other issue uh, over the course of the last four years. And I believe, well I know, that as this Child Poverty Collaborative, which is much bigger than the city, hospitals, nonprofits, uh, business community, etc., this will be the largest uh, on a per capita basis anti-poverty effort anywhere in the country. And if we help 5,000 families, 10,000 kids, 15,000 people, transition out of poverty, it'll be the largest drop anywhere in the country of the poverty rate in a very short amount of time. Something that we can be very proud of. And I personally believe that the greatest part of our reputation as a renaissance and comeback city would be being a national leader of poverty reduction. Where does that come from? For me, well, I think some of you know this, but just to repeat the story some of you may have heard before, you know, I'm a product of faith and family in this city and a commitment to social justice. Uh, when I was, of course, my mom was a school board member and teacher, very patriotic family, very service-oriented family. And when I was at St. X High School, uh, I had a, the, the Jesuits and liberation theology and, and other messages of the gospel had a very big impact on me. And when I was a sophomore, uh, we did a play about the Archbishop Oscar Romero, who was murdered in 1980 in El Salvador for speaking out on behalf of the poor of that country, the oppressed. And he was murdered while saying mass. In many ways, for those of you who don't know his story, he was like the Martin Luther King of his country. And we did a play about his life, which is pretty rare for a Midwestern American high school to do a play about El Salvador. Bishop. But his life story inspired me, and I was interested in what he had to say. But what changed my life was that on the third day of our show, which turned out to be by a, a fateful coincidence, November 16, 1989, and on that morning, the death squads in El Salvador marched into the Jesuit University, I think Xavier University, but in Central America and murdered six Jesuit priests, the cook and the cook's daughter, in the middle of the night. And being at a Jesuit high school, the priests at my high school knew the victims personally. And we had to make a tough decision about whether to go on with the play. And of course, the show must go on. And we did that play that night, and we read the names of the victims before they had even been published in the international press. Now, I have a small part to play. I was killed three times as a peasant, three different scenes. And I really just did it to meet the girl, Samersla, who came over to be part of the show. But it was a life-changing experience because I was pretending to be shot and killed within hours of these Jesuits who had literally given their lives for a higher cause. And so I had an epiphany that day that I would devote my life to public service and to social justice. And so from that moment on, if you I'm proud to say that I've had an incredible blessing to be able to serve in many different capacities. Um, and so in high school, I spent time in Latin America and in Over the Rhine, which was a very different Over the Rhine, working with the poor. In college, I started a migrant farm worker trip to southern Florida and spent a day picking green peppers, something I never want to do again. In law school, I spent my time as a legal aid lawyer for the poor in Boston when I was at Harvard, Boston. Cambridge, 
representing single moms to get the child care support that they deserve. And then when I came back here, um, in addition to my service on city council, as you may know, I started the Ohio Innocence Project, which uses DNA evidence to help people get out of prison who are innocent. And there's been a lot of great discussion in recent years, important discussion, about the criminal justice system and improving and reforming the criminal justice system. But if you've been convicted of a crime, you've already been through your rights, and you have no more rights. Your rights were tried, you got a trial, and you lost. And at that point, you basically have no guaranteed rights. So the Innocence Project work, where we go into people who have already been convicted and demand from the courts a chance for a second, essentially a second trial, is incredibly difficult work because there's no entitlement to it, even if you have evidence of innocence. But the kind of person I am is I work to right wrongs. And I'm proud to say that we've got 25 people out of prison over the last 13 years. Just as when I was on city council during that same period, we went through the racial unrest of 2001. And I'm very proud of the fact that I helped negotiate our historic police community relations accord called Collaborative Agreement. And I'm proud that this year, or I guess technically, yeah, this year, we brought back Saul Green first city in America to voluntarily ask our federal court monitor to come back and do an update on our police community accord to see how we're doing and to make honest recommendations on how to stay ahead of the curve on these issues. And as I said earlier, the things that we are focused on now are most uh, prominently focused on reducing poverty and expanding opportunity. At every stage of my life, I like to think of Robert Kennedy's favorite quote. You know, some people look at things.